<laughs> well, I just returned a few months ago and it was an absolutely incredible mission. Um, and so now I'm really excited because we have a chance in our post-flight period to do some outreach, um, to talk to amazing people like yourself, and also to visit some schools and really connect with the younger generation. And I think that's so important that we share our journey, um, you know, specifically with the young kids so they realize how many possibilities uh, are in their future with the potential that they have. And so I'm really looking forward to that. So I grew up in Northern California, um, about two hours south of the reservation, which is in Covelo um, in Northern California. And I really grew up with a large extended family in the area. We still have some family that live up near the reservation and a lot of family that live in the Petaluma uh, area. So just about 45 minutes north of San Francisco. And so it was a really fun growing up um, with that large extended family. It really gave me a great sense of community and how important that community is. Um, and I think that whether that community would be, you know, your family or your colleagues, or, you know, maybe it's the teachers that, that kids find in school. Uh, I found like throughout the course of my life, how much I really lean on that community just for support and for advice. Um, and so it was really fun growing up in the Bay Area, a lot of exposure just to the outdoors and, and camping. Um, and I did not know that I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a young kid. I know a lot of people have that all figured out, but for me, I, I really wasn't sure. I was interested in math and science, but it wasn't until later in my career when I was flying jets in the Marine Corps that I realized that being an astronaut was actually an, something that was achievable. And I think as a young kid, I just didn't realize that opportunity existed. So, uh, so when I was younger, I knew I wanted to serve in the military. Um, even though there's, there wasn't a ton of military influence in the North Bay, my, saw, my father served in the army as a young man. And so I felt that it was important to serve my country. Um, I really wanted to go to a good college though. I, as I mentioned, I really enjoyed math and, and engineering. And so I decided to go to Annapolis, uh, which is the United States Naval Academy. Uh, and that's in Maryland. And it was a great military school, great engineering school. And I also played soccer as a kid growing up. So those were in my mind, kind of the best of, of all three of those worlds. Um, and so not having a lot of exposure to the military though, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, fortunately, during the summers, we get to do some incredible training with the Navy and the Marine Corps, and I had the chance to fly in the backseat of an F-18. Um, so then I knew, okay, not only do I want to be a Marine, but now I want to fly. Um, and so that's what really started this, this path and this career in aviation. And so after flying and doing a couple of deployments, I was looking at my different opportunities. Okay, what do I want to do next with my next set of orders? And I was interested in becoming a test pilot. Again, I really liked the engineering side of stuff that I missed. And so now I could be a fighter pilot and an engineer as a test pilot. Uh, and so I went to test pilot school. And so it was really during that time frame when I was looking at different opportunities that I saw some biographies or of other astronauts. Uh, or astronauts at the time. And I started reading through those and realizing, oh, this career path is similar. That's similar to me. They've done similar things in their career that I have done. And so that's what really piqued my interest in, uh, in looking at becoming an astronaut. As you mentioned though, the, the odds are still very, very small. So it's important I think for, for people if they want to, you know, if you wanna be an astronaut or whatever goal that you have in life, definitely work towards that goal. But it's also important that you keep all different opportunities open and that you have an open mind. You don't want to, to limit yourself because you're so nearsighted maybe on one opportunity. Well, to be honest, you know, I'm not always confident. Uh, I do, you know, there's been definitely moments in my career and in my life where I doubted myself, uh, where I've come up along challenges or I wasn't performing as well as I wanted to and I started to second guess myself, you know? And I think a lot of that goes back to the community that we talked about before. A lot of that I got from my parents, my mother and my father, uh, you know, just growing up, they instilled this really strong work ethic uh, with to my sister and I, but also this understanding that you're not going to get anywhere by yourself, right? It's really hard to be isolated and go achieve all your dreams by yourself, that it's okay to rely on your friends and family uh, when you need them. And so that was an important lesson that I learned when I was young. And I certainly, certainly relied on them throughout my career. I still do, to be honest, call mom and dad for advice sometimes. Um, you know, and now I have a husband and, and a son, and I really rely on them as well for that support, especially when you're trying to balance, you know, being a mom and going to space and, and doing all the things that you love to do in life.
It's incredible. It is. I wasn't sure, you know, what it was going to feel like. I thought, okay, is this going to feel like a roller coaster? Am I going to be really nervous, you know, strapped in, ready to go? And nervous is not the right word for it. I mean, you're definitely focused, right? Your heart rate is, is elevated. You're excited, but you're not nervous. And I really think it's because you feel prepared. You've gone through hours and hours of training and simulations and, and every contingency you know, that we could think of that would go wrong. You've gone through that training and you have the support of the people on the ground that are, are running the launch operation and preparing you. So it's not a feeling of nervousness, but definitely excitement. It did feel like I was we were in the simulator. We even commented when we're on the launch pad, this feels just like a sim, but it's real. And, um, and so when you're laying down, you're laying on top of the rocket on your back. Uh, and so when we're here on earth, you feel one G, one force of gravity that is coming through your chest because you're laying on your back. And as that countdown starts from 10 all the way down to one, you can feel that rocket come alive. And it's just incredible. And as you accelerate away from the planet, those G forces grow and they're coming through your chest like this. So you need to focus on, on breathing, really. You can feel your tongue fall back into your throat, which is kind of a, an odd sensation. Your arms are really heavy if you're picking them up to do anything. Um, and so that G profile goes up to a four and a half G. So four and a half times the force of gravity uh, through your chest but it's sustained G's, which are really incredible. Um, and then about eight and a half minutes into the flight, when you get the, the second engine cuts off the second stage, it just throws you forward and all those G-forces go away. And then you realize you're starting to float up and everything is just quiet. And it took us all a moment, all four of us in the spacecraft, took us a moment and we said, wait, we made it. We're actually here. Then, yeah, you know, everybody starts to cheer. It was it was really incredible. After so many years of training, you know, it's one of those really special moments. <laughs> Absolutely, it is such a incredible feeling floating in uh, microgravity. It feels to me, it feels like if you ever had a dream that you were floating or flying, um, it really feels that way. And so that was really cool. Um, and I was looking forward to that, that first, you know, moment and those feelings, and then also very excited to look out the window at our planet. And again, I tried to, you know, uh, imagine what that was going to feel like. And, and I had some pretty high expectations. And to be honest, all those expectations were just, just blown away, absolutely exceeded. I mean, it was just incredible, the view of our planet coming by. And it's something that, uh, photographs and videos can't uh, can't capture it because they can't capture the light and the detail and the movement of the planet. Um, and for me, when I think back, you know, on on my heritage, I think back on on my community, and I think back about all the people on Earth. I mean, at that moment, you're looking at our planet that has every human that's alive on it, you know, and, except for the ones that are in our spacecraft. And you look to the vacuum of space and during the daytime, you can't see any spar stars because the planet is so bright, but the blackness of space is the, the blackest black emptiness you've ever seen in your entire life. And you can see in this photo behind me, it still can't absolutely capture it. But as your eye comes down, you can start to pick up this atmosphere. It's this very, very thin, blue, fragile, tiny, tiny line. And that atmosphere is the only thing that's keeping all humans alive and safe from the vacuum of space. And so it gives you this incredible appreciation for our planet to see it and all of her majesty, but it also gives you this huge sense of fragility. Um, and it makes you reflect on, okay, where, where did we all come from? How are we all living on this planet? Our planet is so fragile. What do we need to do to take care of this planet? And as you're looking at earth and you're seeing the land pass by, there's no borders, there's no barriers, there's no those lines and divides, you know, and so it really gives you this appreciation of, of all of humankind and how, how important it is that we share that perspective, I think, with the world. There were a lot of incredible moments. Um, I think uh, for me, one of one that really sticks out in my mind is um, on my second spacewalk. So uh, spacewalk, we put on the spacesuit and you go outside of the space station. And our task was to install some equipment uh, for upgrades to the solar arrays on station. And so Koichi Wakata is a Japanese astronaut and he and I went out the door together. Um, on our first spacewalk, we had some challenges with this hardware integration. Um, and we weren't able to install some of the struts um, because of some interference. And so we came back in the door, to be honest, feeling uh, frustrated, a little very disheartened because we weren't successful in getting that job done. 
but we talked to the ground on the team and they said, okay, we're, we already have a team of people together. We're looking at troubleshooting techniques. We're going to figure this out. We're going to send you out the door next week and we're going to fix this. And, and we did just that. It was amazing to see the teamwork of all the people on the ground, thousands of people coming together, the astronauts in space. And we come up with a plan with a bunch of troubleshooting techniques to go out the door. And you know what? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. We break a tool. It won't go in. And in hours, you're out there really working on that, but you have this, this really, this very strong sense of support from people from the planet coming up with ideas. And you also are just focused and dedicated to making this happen. You're not going to give up on it. And we worked together um, and with the help from the ground, found a technique to get this strut installed. And again, we were yeah, just cheering. It was so incredible to overcome those challenges and to overcome them together as a team. So that was a very a proud moment for us personally, but I think for also for NASA as a whole. I mean, getting used to microgravity is, it's fun and it can be really frustrating at first too, because everything, everything floats away. And so you can't sit anything down uh, everything needs to be Velcroed down or taped down. And so as you're working, you may have a lot of tools that are in a bag. You open that bag, everything starts to float away um, and you can lose things very easily. And so you just have to learn to adapt to that environment, even though you know it's going to be that way. It takes you a couple of weeks to really adapt and start to feel um, more, more efficient at doing your job. Um, and then even little things, you know, like eating can be a challenge because your food floats everywhere and you're trying not to make a mess, but it's also really fun when you can just kind of toss, you know, toss M&Ms back and forth to your crewmates. And, and we had a lot of fun time, you know, playing with food and water um, because everything behaves so differently when you're in microgravity. The advice I would give is it's, it's so important, I think, to um, you know, we talked a little bit about confidence. It's okay if you don't have that, that perfect confidence. It's okay if you don't have your life plan all figured out. Don't let that deter you from making these good choices or applying for that difficult class or taking that AP class or trying out for that soccer team. Don't ever limit yourself. That's the most important thing. Um, and then surround yourself with people that that's your community, uh, whether that be your family or your friends, choose those people that are going to support you and help empower you to, to establish these goals and these dreams in life. Then the difficult part comes, have the discipline to go then after those goals and those dreams. You establish them, but then it's a long road to get there and you will have setbacks and that's okay. Uh, that's part of the journey and part of life. I think everybody uh, has challenges in life, and I certainly had my fair share of challenges. Um, you know, I think back to my military training, um, learning to fly and to fly a jet for the first time. I didn't have any military background, and sometimes there were phases of flight where I didn't perform as well as I wanted to. Um, and that's really easy to then get frustrated and start to doubt yourself because the next day you're going to go out and you're going to perform that flight again. And there's a lot of pressure. If you don't perform well, you're going to get kicked out of flight school. Um, and so those, those moments where you struggle, where you have something, where you're, you're reaching a wall that you feel like, um, it's important to take what you can from those moments, learn what you can, and then jump back in at the next opportunity and move forward with that. I think, um, you know, athletics growing up helped me learn some of those lessons when I was really young, that playing soccer was a big part. You learn to deal with adversity. You learn to deal um, with, with people on a team that maybe you're, you're struggling with um, relationship-wise. You learn a lot about peer leadership. You are gonna lose a game. You're going, somebody's gonna beat you on the field. They're going to be faster than you, uh, but you learn to overcome some of those uh, that adversity and some of those challenges. Uh, and I think you'll find those throughout life. I mean, even today, um, you know, in my in my current job now, or even as life with friends or, or as a mom, you're going to find those challenges. Um, and I think it's okay to to feel you know frustrated by those, but learn from those, reach out to your community, and then move forward. Uh, it was just so incredible to see really the sunrises and the sunsets. You know, we talk a lot about, and I think it's important, everybody has a different, different concepts of, uh, you know, religion or spiritualism or whatever, whatever it is that they hold true and important to, to them. And, and I think when you see the planet and you see these, 
these colors of the sunrise. I remember on my second spacewalk, I was at the very end of the space station on the, on the right side of it, and I was routing some cables. And I wanted to be intentional on the spacewalk to take a couple moments to, to really just reflect on, on, on what I'm doing and, and the opportunity that I have and, and seeing our beautiful planet below. And the first spacewalk, I was, I was just too busy and too focused to do that. So I really wanted to be intentional on the second one. And I did. And I took about 30 seconds and I just paused and I looked down at towards my feet, which were just, I'm holding onto the station and my feet are out. And as I looked down, the sun is just coming up around the planet. And it was just the most beautiful display of colors. And the whole planet, you know, lights up for the next 45 minutes as, as we're out there doing a spacewalk. And, and so what are... Whatever you hold in your heart as, as I mentioned, your religion or your, your spiritualism, it is something that is so magnificent. It really um, just has you reflect on how incredible our planet is and, and how incredible really the human, human race is. Um, and so that, that just appreciation uh, really changed me. Um, and, and I think it will for, for the rest of my, my life. It gives you this amazing appreciation for people, um, and how important it is that, that we work together and important that you, that you reflect upon, you know, your heritage and where you came from, and then really to reach out and to share that with other people. <laughs> That's a challenge. I am not going to joke with you. That is a big challenge. So you have 45 days really, yeah, of dedicated re rehab. So two hours a day when you're back on, on earth, um, just training your body. You're really strong when you come back. We work out a lot when you're on station, which is important because otherwise you would just atrophy your muscles and you, you would lose a lot of bone density. So you're strong, but you are not used to carrying your head around in one G and your head is very heavy. So you're exhausted for the first couple of weeks. It's, you know, you get halfway through a day and you have to lay down and take a nap. You know, additionally, your vestibular system is, is really out of whack. So you don't have balance you don't have your agility. Uh, and so we work with an amazing group of trainers to make sure that our bodies are healthy so that you don't get injured, you know, when you come back to earth and you still don't have your balance. Uh, but it is a bit of a bit of a challenge. I'm still not back to normal uh, running to my, my normal paces. I hear that takes about six months to get to get back to normal uh, for that. But uh, but my balance is back and and everything feels pretty, pretty normal now. I'm not so tired anymore. <laughs> that was quite a ride, quite a ride. And so you're floating around. We've been in zero G for for about five and a half months now. And it's the same um, idea of those G forces coming through your chest. It's the same thing when you're coming back to the planet. You're on your back and you have the heat shield that's coming towards the atmosphere. And that heat shield is what's protecting you from the buildup of temperature as, as we re-enter the atmosphere. Um, and there's two windows in Dragon that are down kind of towards your feet. And so as we start to come down, you start to hit that atmosphere and you start to decelerate. And that's the G-forces that you're feeling. And about half, one half of a G, so half of the force of, that you're going to feel on gravity. I remember looking over at Josh and being like, oh my gosh, this feels so heavy. And we're, we're only at a half a G. Again, that profile coming home goes up to 4.6 to 4 Gs. And now you're feeling really heavy because you're not used to the G-forces at, well, um, at all. And um, as you come through the atmosphere, you, uh, this plasma builds up um, on the windows and you can look up and you can see that your glow, a glowing fireball essentially coming back to the planet. And you can see this yellow and orange and these beautiful sparks coming down. But as you move your head in that pitch direction, your vestibular system Will, will flip and it will tumble you. So I was able to look out the window, like down by my feet about three times. And then I said, okay, I better just keep my head still um, and, and focus on the displays as we're coming, coming back through. Um, and then it just felt really, really heavy uh, once, you're, once you're back on earth for a while. It's, it's, a, it's a very odd feeling. Um, I would tell my younger self just to, you know, that you're doing an okay job, hang in there, really. I think as a, as a kid growing up, especially these days, there's so much pressure um, on, on children to what's your career path going to be? You know, what, what courses are you going to take in high school and in college and, and everything that you, and that you want to do. And so I would, I would tell myself not to worry about it so much, really to follow those passions in life, to, to continue to do well in school and make sure you open up all those doors and all those opportunities. Um, and then take a moment, like I did on that second spacewalk, take a moment to slow down sometimes and just reflect and, and just appreciate the, you know, the amazing opportunities that you have. Sometimes I think as a, as a kid, you move so fast through life. It's just so busy and it seems so fast paced that you forget to sit and, and just reflect on, 
you know, for now, like summer, summer just hit. I just dropped my kid off at summer camp and I told him the same thing. When you're at camp, just, just pause for a couple moments and just look around and just be grateful for this amazing opportunity that you have. So I'll be in my post flight through September. So I'll have a chance to take um, some vacation with my family. We have some great camping trips, uh, trips planned. We're gonna spend some time out in North, Northern California. Uh, and then we come back to the office and there's so much going on right now. I'm not sure what my next role will be or my next mission, but we have operations obviously in low earth orbit to the International Space Station. We just assigned the Artemis II crew and that's the first crew that's gonna go around the moon. And as part of the Artemis mission, eventually we're gonna land on the moon and have sustained human presence on the moon. And so there's so much going on at, at NASA with human exploration, with our international partners and, and commercial industry as well. I'm not sure my role will be, but whatever it is, I'm really excited to support those uh, exploration missions. 